The Battle of Blenheim, fought on 13 August 1704, was a major battle of the War of the Spanish Succession. The overwhelming Allied victory ensured the safety of Vienna from the Franco-Bavarian army, thus preventing the collapse of the Grand Alliance. Louis XIV of France sought to knock Emperor Leopold out of the war by seizing Vienna, the Habsburg capital, and gain a favorable peace settlement. The dangers to Vienna were considerable. The Elector of Bavaria and Marshal Marsen's forces in Bavaria threatened from the west, and Marshal Vendome's large army in northern Italy posed a serious danger with a potential offensive through the Brenner Pass. Vienna was also under pressure from Rakotsi's Hungarian revolt from its eastern approaches. Realizing the danger, the Duke of Marlborough resolved to alleviate the peril to Vienna by marching his forces south from Bedburg and help maintain Emperor Leopold within the Grand Alliance. A combination of deception and brilliant administration, designed to conceal his true destination from friend and foe alike, enabled Marlborough to march 250 miles unhindered from the Low Countries to the River Danube in five weeks. After securing Donalworth on the Danube, Marlborough sought to engage the electors and Marson's army before Marshal Tallard could bring reinforcements through the Black Forest. However, with the Franco-Bavarian commanders reluctant to fight until their numbers were deemed sufficient, the Duke enacted a policy of plundering in Bavaria designed to force the issue. The tactic proved unsuccessful, but when Tallard arrived to bolster the elector's army and Prince Eugene arrived with reinforcements for the Allies, the two armies finally met on the banks of the Danube in and around the small village of Blindheim. Blenheim has gone down in history as one of the turning points of the War of the Spanish Succession. Bavaria was knocked out of the war, and Louis's hopes for a quick victory came to an end. France suffered over 30,000 casualties, including the commander-in-chief, Marshal Tallard, who was taken captive to England. Before the 1704 campaign ended, the Allies had taken Landau and the towns of Trier and Trebuck on the Moselle in preparation for the following year's campaign into France itself. Background By 1704, the War of the Spanish Succession was in its fourth year. The previous year had been one of success for France and her allies, most particularly on the Danube, where Marshal Villers and the Elector of Bavaria had created a direct threat to Vienna, the Habsburg capital. Vienna had been saved by dissension between the two commanders, leading to the brilliant Villers being replaced by the less dynamic Marshal Marcin. Nevertheless, by 1704, the threat was still real. Rakotsi's Hungarian revolt was already threatening the empire's eastern approaches, and Marshal Vendome's forces threatened an invasion from northern Italy. In the courts of Versailles and Madrid, Vienna's fall was confidently anticipated, an event which would almost certainly have led to the collapse of the Grand Alliance. To isolate the Danube from any Allied intervention, Marshal Villeroy's 46,000 troops were expected to pin the 70,000 Dutch and English troops around Maastricht in the Low Countries, while General de Coigny protected Alsace against surprise with a further corps. The only forces immediately available for Vienna's defence were Prince Louis of Baden's force of 36,000 stationed in the lines of Stolhofen to watch. Marshal Tallard at Strasbourg, there was also a weak force of 10,000 men under Field Marshal Count Limburg Styrum observing Ulm. Both the Imperial Austrian ambassador in London, Count Ratislaw, and the Duke of Marlborough realized the implications of the situation on the Danube. The Dutch, however, who clung to their troops for their country's protection, were against any adventurous military operation as far south as the Danube and would never willingly permit any major weakening of the forces in the Spanish Netherlands. Marlborough, realizing the only way to ignore Dutch wishes was by the use of secrecy and guile, set out to deceive his Dutch allies by pretending to simply move his troops to the Moselle, a plan approved of by The Hague, but once there, he would slip the Dutch leash and link up with Austrian forces in southern Germany. 
My intentions, wrote the Duke from The Hague on 29 April to his governmental confidant, Sidney Godolphin, are to march with the English to Coblins and declare that I intend to campaign on the Moselle, but when I come there, to write to the Dutch states that I think it absolutely necessary for the saving of the empire to march with the troops under my command and to join with those that are in Germany in order to make measures with Prince Louis of Baden for the speedy reduction of the Elector of Bavaria. Prelude. Protagonists marched to the Danube Scarlet Caterpillar, upon which all eyes were at once fixed, began to crawl steadfastly day by day across the map of Europe dragging the whole war with it. Winston Churchill, Marlborough's march started on 19 May from Bedburg, 20 miles northwest of Cologne. The army consisted of 66 squadrons, 31 battalions and 38 guns and mortars totaling 21,000 men. This force was to be augmented en route such that by the time Marlborough reached the Danube, it would number 40,000. Whilst Marlborough led his army, General Overkirk would maintain a defensive position in the Dutch Republic in case Villeroy mounted an attack. The Duke had assured the Dutch that if the French were to launch an offensive he would return in good time, but Marlborough calculated that as he marched south, the French commander would be drawn after him. In this assumption Marlborough proved correct. Villeroy shadowed the Duke with 30,000 men in 60 squadrons and 42 battalions. The military dangers in such an enterprise were numerous. Marlborough's lines of communication along the Rhine would be hopelessly exposed to French interference, for Louis' generals controlled the left bank of the river and its central reaches. Such a long march would almost certainly involve a high wastage of men and horses through exhaustion and disease. However, Marlborough was convinced of the urgency, I am very sensible that I take a great deal upon me, he had earlier written to Godolphin, but should I act otherwise, the empire would be undone. Whilst Allied preparations had progressed, the French were striving to maintain and resupply Marshal Marcin. Marcin had been operating with the Elector of Bavaria against the Imperial commander, Prince Louis of Baden, and was somewhat isolated from France. His only lines of communication lay through the rocky passes of the Black Forest. However, on 14 May, with considerable skill Marshal Tallard managed to bring 10,000 reinforcements and vast supplies and munitions through the difficult terrain. Whilst outmaneuvering Baron Thungnen, the imperial general who sought to block his path, Tallard then returned with his own force to the Rhine, once again sidestepping Thungin's efforts to intercept him. The whole operation was an outstanding military achievement. On 26 May, Marlborough reached Koblenz, where the Moselle meets the Rhine. If he intended an attack along the Moselle the Duke must now turn west, but, instead, the following day the army crossed to the right bank of the Rhine. There will be no campaign on the Moselle, wrote Villeroy who had taken up a defensive position on the river. The English have all gone up into Germany, a second possible objective now occurred to the French, an Allied incursion into Alsace and an attack, on the city of Strasbourg. Marlborough skillfully encouraged this apprehension by constructing bridges across the Rhine at Philipsburg, a ruse that not only encouraged Villeroy to come to Talad's aid in the defence of Alsace, but one that ensured the French plan to march on Vienna remained paralysed by uncertainty. With Villeroy shadowing Marlborough's every move, Marlborough's gamble that the French would not move against the weakened Dutch position in the Netherlands paid off. In any case, Marlborough had promised to return to the Netherlands if a French attack developed there, transferring his troops down the Rhine on barges at a rate of 80 miles a day. Encouraged by this promise the States General agreed to release the Danish contingent of seven battalions and 22 squadrons as a reinforcement. Marlborough reached Lardenburg, in the plain of the Necker and the Rhine, and there halted for three days to rest his cavalry and allow the guns and infantry to close up. On 6 June he arrived at Wiesloch, south of Heidelberg. 
The following day, the Allied army swung their way from the Rhine towards the hills of the Swabian Jura and the Danube beyond. At last Marlborough's destination was established without doubt. Strategy On 10 June, the Duke met for the first time the President of the Imperial War Council, Prince Eugene, accompanied by Count Gratislaw, at the village of Mundelsheim, halfway between the Danube and the Rhine. By 13 June, the Imperial Field Commander, Prince Louis of Baden, had joined them in Gross Herpatch. The three generals commanded a force of nearly 110,000 men. At conference it was decided that Eugene would return with 28,000 men to the lines of Stolhofen on the Rhine to keep an eye on Villeroy and Tallard, and prevent him going to the aid of the Franco-Bavarian army on the Danube. Meanwhile, Marlborough's and Baden's forces would combine, totaling 80,000 men for the march on the Danube to seek out the Elector and Martin before they could be reinforced. Knowing Marlborough's destination, Tallard and Villeroy met at Landau in the Palatinate on 13 June to rapidly construct an action plan to save Bavaria. But the rigidity of the French command system was such that any variations from the original plan had to be sanctioned by Versailles. The Count of Merode Westerloo, commander of the Flemish troops in Talid's army, wrote, One thing is certain. We delayed our march from Alsace for far too long and quite inexplicably. Approval from Louis arrived on 27 June. Tallard was to reinforce Marcin and the Elector on the Danube via the Black Forest. With 40 battalions and 50 squadrons, Villeroy was to pin down the Allies defending the lines of Stolhofen, or, if the Allies should move all the forces to the Danube, he was to join with Marshal Tallard and General de Coignies with 8,000 men, would protect Alsace. On 1 July Talad's army of 35,000 recrossed the Rhine at Kale and began its march. Meanwhile, on the 22nd of June, Marlborough's forces linked up with Baden's imperial forces at Lonsheim. A distance of 250 miles had been covered in five weeks. Thanks to a carefully planned timetable, the effects of wear and tear had been kept to a minimum. Captain Parker described the march discipline as we marched through the country of our allies. Commissars were appointed to furnish us with all manner of necessaries for man and horse. The soldiers had nothing to do but pitch their tents, boil kettles and lie down to rest in response to Marlborough's maneuvers. The Elector and Marcin, conscious of their numerical disadvantage with only 40,000 men, moved their forces to the entrenched camp at Dillingen on the north bank of the Danube. Marlborough could not attack Dillingen because of a lack of siege guns, he was unable to bring any from the Low Countries, and Baden had failed to supply any despite assurances to the contrary. The Allies, nevertheless, needed a base for provisions and a good river crossing. On 2 July, therefore, Marlborough stormed the key fortress of Skellenberg on the heights above the town of Donalworth. Count Jean d'Arco had been sent with 12,000 men from the Franco-Bavarian camp to hold the town in Grassy Hill. But after a ferocious and bloody battle, inflicting enormous casualties on both sides, Skellenberg finally succumbed, forcing Don Orworth to surrender shortly afterwards. The elector, knowing his position at Dillingen was now not tenable, took up a position behind the strong fortifications of Augsburg. Talad's march, meanwhile, presented a dilemma for Eugene. If the Allies were not to be outnumbered on the Danube, Eugene realized he must either try to cut Talad off before he could get there, or he must hasten to reinforce Marlborough. However, if he withdrew from the Rhine to the Danube, Villeroy might also make a move south to link up with the Elector and Marcin. Eugene compromised. Leaving 12,000 troops behind guarding the lines of Stolhofen, he marched off with the rest of his army to forestall Tallard. Lacking in numbers, Eugene could not seriously disrupt Tallard's march. Nevertheless, the French marshal's progress was proving pitifully slow. Tallard's force had suffered considerably more than Marlborough's troops on their march. Many of his cavalry horses were suffering from glanders 
and the mountain passes were proving tough for the 2,000 wagons of provisions. Local German peasants, angry at French plundering, compounded Talad's problems, leading Merode west to Luta Bamone. The enraged peasantry killed several thousand of our men before the army was clear of the Black Forest. Additionally, Talad had insisted on besieging the little town of Villingen for six days, but abandoned the enterprise on discovering the approach of Eugene. The elector in Augsburg was informed on 14 July that Talad was on his way through the Black Forest. This good news bolstered the elector's policy of inaction, further encouraging him to wait for the reinforcements. But this reticence to fight induced Marlborough to undertake a controversial policy of spoliation in Bavaria, burning buildings and crops throughout the rich lands south of the Danube. This had two aims. Firstly to put pressure on the elector to fight or come to terms before Tallard arrived with reinforcements, and secondly, to ruin Bavaria as a base from which the French and Bavarian armies could attack Vienna, or pursue the Duke into Franconia if, at some stage, he had to withdraw northwards. But this destruction, coupled with a protracted siege of rain, caused Prince Eugene to lament. Since the Donalworth action I cannot admire their performances, and later to conclude, if he has to go home without having achieved his objective, he will certainly be ruined. Nevertheless, Strategically the Duke had been able to place his numerically stronger forces between the Franco-Bavarian army and Vienna. Final positioning Marshal Tallard, with 34,000 men, reached Ulm, joining with the Elector and Marcin in Augsburg on 5 August. Also on 5 August, Eugene reached Hochstadt, riding that same night to meet with Marlborough at Schrobenhausen. Marlborough knew it was necessary that another crossing point over the Danube would be required in case Don Orworth fell to the enemy. On 7 the August, therefore, the first of Baden's 15,000 imperial troops left Marlborough's main force to besiege the heavily defended city of Ingolstadt. 20 miles farther down the Danube, with Eugene's forces at Hochstadt on the north bank of the Danube, and Marlborough's at Rain on the south bank. Tallard and the elector debated their next move. Tallard preferred to bide his time, replenish supplies and allow Marlborough's Danube campaign to flounder in the colder weeks of autumn. The elector and Marcin, however, newly reinforced, were keen to push ahead. The French and Bavarian commanders eventually agreed on a plan and decided to attack Eugene's smaller force. On 9 August, the Franco-Bavarian forces began to cross to the north bank of the Danube. On 10 August, Eugene sent an urgent dispatch reporting that he was falling back to Don Orworth. The enemy have marched. It is almost certain that the whole army is crossing the Danube at Loringen. The plain of Dillingen is crowded with troops. Everything, my lord, consists in speed and that you put yourself forthwith in movement to join me tomorrow, without which I fear it will be too late. By a series of brilliant marches Marlborough concentrated his forces on Don Orworth and, by noon the 11th of August, the link-up was complete. During the 11th of August, Tallard pushed forward from the river crossings at Dillingen, by the 12th of August. The Franco-Bavarian forces were encamped behind the small river Nebel near the village of Blenheim on the plain of Hochstadt. That same day Marlborough and Eugene carried out their own reconnaissance of the French position from the church spire at Tapfheim, and moved their combined forces to Munster, five miles from the French camp. A French reconnaissance under the Marquis de Silly went forward to probe the enemy but were driven off by Allied troops who had deployed to cover the pioneers of the advancing army, laboring to bridge the numerous streams in the area and improve the passage leading westwards to Hochstadt. Marlborough quickly moved forward two brigades under the command of General Wilkes and Brigadier Row to secure the narrow strip of land between the Danube and the wooded Fuchsburg Hill, at the Schweningen defile. Talad's army numbered 56,000 men and 90 guns. The Army of the Grand Alliance, 52,000 men and 66 guns, 
Some Allied officers who were acquainted with the superior numbers of the enemy, and aware of their strong defensive position, ventured to remonstrate with Marlborough about the hazards of attacking, but the Duke was resolute, I know the danger, yet a battle is absolutely necessary, and I rely on the bravery and discipline of the troops, which will make amends for our disadvantages. Marlborough and Eugene decided to risk everything, and agree to attack on the following day.